Good morning. 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 Hello. Everyone. Hello. Let's allow a couple more minutes for folks to filter in and then uh, and then get started. Fanny won't be joining us today. All right, let's get started. Um, it's nice to see you all. Welcome to 2021. Um, I think there's just a few sorts of uh, a few announcements and things to uh, items to to cover, and then maybe we can have kind of a more uh, a more open conversation. And would love to hear um, any thoughts or projects or ideas percolating. Uh, from the group. Uh, so the first um, the first item is just the, the fellowship. Um, I, I know uh, several of you on the call um, have pending applications to the fellowship. Um, just wanted to let you all know that we are uh, hard at work on going through all of them in detail. There's a ton of amazing applications. Um, and uh, I guess um, if all goes as planned, you will hear from us uh, by the end of the week. Um, so we're we're just about we're just about there. Um, um, but thank you for all of the uh, the work that you did up applying, and um, I, I think we're going to have a, an amazing um, amazing cohort. with sort of an embarrassment of riches in terms of uh, in terms of the applications. Anything to add to that, Jen, or? No, oh, yeah, it's been, it, we went through a bunch uh, together yesterday and they were really exciting. So it's it's a hard choice that we're faced with. Yeah, I think, uh, I think next time around we might have to uh, expand our capacity a little bit and <laughs> bring yeah. a, a bigger group, yeah. Definitely. Uh, the other sort of new announcement is uh, we recently sort of re revamped our website. Um, so if you go to radicalexchange.org uh, and check out a sort of redesigned uh, website, 
would love to get your feedback on um, on how you think it looks, the sort of ease of use, anything that jumps out at you, um, so that we can continue to uh, to refine it. Yeah, and there's still some things being added to it. Um, so more videos from the conferences, for example. And there's some places, like there's an events page where all of that can be found, but we're adding that to the section called a kiosk. And we'll also be adding additional readings and tools to each of the concept pages. So if there's anything you know about that's not there that you think should be there, let us know. Um, and then the next uh, sort of announcement item and um, would love to get a little bit of conversation on this one is the 2021 conference. So we're um, obviously there's still a ton of uncertainty about uh, what this year is going to look like and, and what's going to be possible. Um, however, we are, are operating with a, a tentative assumption that um, at least the final quarter of this year, it will be possible to have uh, physical gatherings, fingers crossed. Um, and um, we would like to do that, uh, we think, but we, we also want to, you know, if, if we're going to do a, a, a big uh, physical gathering the way we did in 2019, um, the planning sort of needs to start now. And so we have kind of a, a, a tentative vision of putting on an event that would, um, that would sort of span multiple locations. So we, we would probably have the, the, the kind of tentative plan, and this is, this is what we want feedback about because we haven't, this isn't final and we need to start planning it now if we wanna do it. The sort of tentative idea would be to do one conference in, um, in East Asia, probably Taipei, and then, and then another conference in um, probably the East Coast of the United States, possibly Europe, or possibly in both of those places, and you know, with sort of other smaller satellite events uh, in, um, in in Latin America or or or, or wherever else, um, uh, with the idea of kind of uh, interweaving the programming of of the of the two primary events, so that we would have you know one like one thing going for for example in um, in in Boston or in Brazil, and another thing going uh, on like the same weekend in uh, in Taipei, so that the two um, you know and then they would be sort of staggered in terms of time zones, and the two might sort of talk to each other, interact with each other a bit. Um, uh, so that's the kind of that's kind of what we're working with, but um, yeah, I I want to hear um, what you all think in terms of whether does it really make sense to do um, a physical event? Is the world going to go back to that? Is that what we need? Um, Is it responsible uh, environmentally? Right. Um, uh, so I, yeah, obviously there's really big pluses and minuses and question marks in all of this, but um, yeah, we'd love to hear any thoughts. I'd love to join one. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm itching to get out of the house and see some people and just be able to hang out for extended periods of time. But um, the, the, some of that's out of our control. I'd attend if responsible and available. Thumbs up, Joe. I'm interested what Kalia would would think. She might not be able to respond right now. Oh, come on. Somebody's got an opinion. Oh. 
All right. Well, hey, Matt, I'll, I'll chime in here really quickly. Sure. Um, Thanks, sorry, Luke. I was uh, doing things without a camera on. Um, I, I think that the two model conference is really good for addressing some of those, those negative concerns you're talking about, especially travel and accessibility. Um, I, I wonder if you have any examples where that has worked successfully, because I, I'm thinking it could be possible that one will kind of become the more the, the main one or kind of the, the bigger one, the more popular one, and folks at the other one will miss out. And if there's uh, technological solutions to make it feel more like one conference. Sadly, I, so I think like uh, one, one uh, community I'm interested in is the collective intelligence community who was going to do that exact mm -hmm. thing this year. And then they ended up just making it all virtual because of course of COVID. Um, yeah, so I guess that I, I think it's a great idea. And I would also just love to see some people um, and see you all, that'd, that'd be great. But uh, the, uh, I, I wonder if that's like a, a particular issue, this like kind of make having one be the main conference or not really having meaningful interactions between the folks in two different physical locations um, could be solved technologically. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, I think, um... I, I doubt there would be that much so you know real time social interaction between the two, uh, be, especially because they would be in different time zones. But I do think it would you know the thought is that there could be sort of interesting back and forth as, in terms of uh, in terms of speakers or programming. So you might have you know one talk on the same topic in Taipei and then another talk you know the next you know sort of like nine hours later. Um, in, in the other location, you could have some sort of interesting back and forth like that. And I think, uh, I think that, you know, given that if, if we had two events on sort of different sides of the world, there would be more than enough, you know, great speakers and great guests um, uh, in both places, you know. Um, there are also some unknowns that we don't know <clears throat> about, for example, will there be more restrictions on how many people can gather? So the main aim is to make it as accessible as possible, given those unknowns, if we can't all meet in person. Um, but to, to really, you know, have a, a megaphone from Taiwan as to what they've done and hear from that side of the world and have that speak to the rest of the world and respond. And so if it's, you know, I guess if the pandemic takes a worse turn because of the new strain, maybe we might be looking at more how to have chapters, kind of lead satellite gatherings, at least that way you can meet who's around you regionally. Yeah, and I mean, for, for what it's worth, my thought is that the, I think that the, I think physical gatherings remain an important part of human life. I mean, I, I think it's uh, um, the kind of connections that are made uh, when people are in the same room are, are just different from the kinds of connections that are made otherwise. Um, and I, I, I'm really hopeful that we can, um, you know, continue to, to build those kinds of deep connections in the, in the radical exchange community. Um, but obviously want to do so in a way that um, is, isn't wasteful in terms of travel and stuff. Yeah, hi, Kalia, I got your hand raised. Yeah, I just like to, um, one, agree with you. I don't think gatherings are gonna go away, but I also think that, um, that there will be a shift away from sort of talking heads modalities at events towards using what the only thing you can do or you know the thing that you can't do as well online as you can in person which is the type time for connection and conversation and spontaneity so I'd like to encourage, you know, we had this conversation before, before COVID about the possibility of having, using um, interactive modalities like open space technology or perhaps World Cafe of like, that it's attracting the people who are in this community and then inviting the conversations that want to happen in real time to happen, <clears throat> leaning more towards that than putting people on stage and sort of having cocktail parties 
on the side, right? Like yep. that the meat of, of our time can be in meaningful, semi-organized conversation as opposed to the two poles of we often have found in events um, in the past. Totally agree. Yeah, me too. I, I, uh, I couldn't agree more. And I think that, um, I think we're, w whatever this next conference looks like, if we can do it in person, we're going to try to take full advantage of people being in the same room and um, interactivity. Um, okay. The uh, next item on the agenda is um, our uh, the the tool that we're building for uh, community governance, which is to say, uh, and this is this is a really exciting project that um, we've been working on for a number of months, uh, which is just about ready to. Uh, to expose to the public um, and to the community. Uh, it's, a, it's a system that will allow uh, all of us and, and others connected to the Radical Exchange community to sort of weigh in on the direction of the Radical Exchange movement and sort of priorities that the Radical Exchange Foundation should be focused on. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's, it's going, it's also sort of an, an experimental democracy tool that if it works well, and once we sort of get opportunities to refine it could become something that other sorts of open textured, uh, decentralized, unconventional communities use to, uh, to set their own agendas and to, and to assist in their, um, and to sort of, you know, push their, their own governance outwards. Um, I think we've got Alex on the phone and Alex would be, it'd be great if you could take like a few minutes to describe the, uh, what, we've, what we've been working on. Unless that is a different Alex, maybe we don't have. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, wrong Alex. <laughs> so, uh, um, sorry about that, Never mind. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get that. If uh, I, yeah. can, I can pull it up, but we can move on to the next agenda item and then we can go back to it while I pull it up. Okay. Um, Nick, I was wondering if you might like to say a few words about the um, the work you've been doing on uh, on data leverage. Um, I think it's really relevant and interesting. Yes, yeah, I would love to. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, because I think I don't know a lot of the people here, but I know some. I, I'm uh, Nick Vincent. I'm based in uh, Evanston in Illinois right now. I'm a PhD student, a fourth year, um, studying a bunch of stuff that is kind of related to, to, to things that folks in the radical exchange community are interested in as well. Um, and lately, we've been uh, working on several projects related to this concept of data leverage, which I guess roughly just refers to, it's highly related to the, the data dignity uh, area of research and knowledge. And the idea is that anytime there's a relationship wherein a tech company or any large organization could be a state actor as well, um, is relying on data from that's being produced by a population of, of, of by a group of people, then that, pe that group of people can take a variety of actions to change the data and then kind of affect the organization's technology. So the, the classic examples would be trying to bring down YouTube's recommender system because you're mad at Alphabet or trying to bring down Facebook's ad targeting because you're bad at Facebook. But it could also mean uh, taking advantage of data portability that is advancing in places like Europe and California to kind of grab all your data and, and bring it to a competitor and try to exert leverage against companies that way. And so we've done a bunch of conceptual work on this topic and trying to kind of lay out a framework of what are all the different ways people could exert this, this so-called data leverage? Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different types? What are the, the ways this could obviously go wrong? Um, 
and there are a lot because it's really related to uh, research in kind of security and privacy and bad actors in machine learning and, and bad actors trying to uh, you know, co-opt or find loopholes in, in machine learning systems. So there's definitely a lot of ways it could go wrong. But we also think it, there's a lot of ways it could go right. And generally the idea is, um, or my kind of uh, activist perspective on this is I think that data leverage is a really good opportunity to shift the balance of power, which is, as I guess we all talk about, uh, very asymmetric right now in terms of large tech companies and organizations having lots of lots of power over um, the data collection process and the actual data generators, i.e. the public, having very little power. Um, so all that being said, lots of conceptual work. We have a bunch of papers coming out, which is you know good for my, uh, my career, but not necessarily going to make an impact in the short term. And so what we want to do now is start to uh, build some actual tools that make it easier for, for people to engage in data leverage. So tools that make it easier to join a so-called data strike or to do something like grab your data and share it with a with a new um, startup that you want to support that's going to challenge an incumbent. Um, and this is kind of a this is an up in air, up in the air project. This is something I'll probably be starting on in earnest uh, later this month. That's kind of my next big research project, and I'm just like really looking to to try to find really anyone who's vaguely interested in this or wants to collaborate in any form. Um, I'd love to to talk, and we can you know talk more later and I'll, I'd be happy to share some of the thoughts or just see what you have to think. So yeah, I, I wanted, I, I had asked Matt, uh, I guess last year, um, if I could do this little pitch at some point in Radical Exchange uh, community call. So here's my pitch. Yes, thank you. Um, there's a couple, I, I wonder if just to give sort of other folks a clearer picture of the, uh, of the work. Um, for me, it's helpful to see the different sort of levers that you're talking about. So in other words, these, these are ways that, that groups of people can use their, their data to, to, to influence the, the behavior of people on the other side of the transaction. So, so there's, in, in other words, there's ways there, like, like helpful to me in, in, in your paper was this sort of taxonomy of like, um, people can group together to intentionally provide data. People can group together to sort of intentionally withhold data. People can group together to intentionally like modify or or uh, or poison data. Um, can you say a little bit more about what those like what those levers are and how you think they could they could work and how we should be thinking about them? Yeah, definitely. So I just posted the preprint also because that might be helpful if anyone likes to to read. Um, so basically in, in this, this paper, we lay out this, this three lever frameworks. We say data leverage is this concept that's kind of been vaguely alluded to by a lot of different fields, but no one has kind of uh, explicitly made up a term for it. So that's one of the contributions to the papers. We make up this term and provide a definition. Um, and then the three levers are, um, well, so first, if we're kind of doing a, if you imagine a tree-based uh, framework of, of all the different ways we can use data leverage, uh, fundamentally, there's, there's two versions. Either you hurt an existing, uh, machine learning technology or data dependent technology so it could be ai machine learning statistics um business decision making etc uh or you you help a new uh competitor and so the two versions that hurt a existing technology are data strikes where you withhold or delete your data and I, i'm just kind of using you generally a group of people uh withholds or deletes their data that would otherwise help to benefit some profit generating uh, ai technology or you engage in data poisoning where you basically give the, you trick the data scientists at the firm into using bad data that will actually make their performance worse. And this is, could be um, something like shilling, making a recommender system recommend things that are actually quite bad. Um, but it could also be just kind of generally degrading the performance of an algorithmic system uh, so that everyone gets bad results from it. So those are the two kind of harm-based forms of, of data levers. So that's data strikes and data poisoning. Um, and there's interesting legal and ethical questions there. In some jurisdictions, you might not be able to delete your data. In others, you might be able to. Um, data poisoning raises a lot of ethical questions where in, in certain contexts, people might not want to engage in what's basically lying or fraud for the purpose of exerting leverage or for the purpose of, it, of engaging in collective action. Um, so there's some complicated questions that data leverage organizers have to have to face around those two. On the other side, the, the help-based side, this what we've called conscious data contribution, kind of in a, as an allusion to uh, conscious consumerism, that's where people band together to support a new uh, startup that they think is ethical or better along some some access some value access that they are uh, that the group agrees upon. Um, that's where you kind of grab your data from existing repositories or you generate new data 
with the intent purpose of helping this new uh, company compete, have a competitive machine learning technology, um, and, and you're exerting leverage that way. Uh, and that we think that that one is actually generally less, uh, will have less kind of tough ethical and legal questions that organizers will have to face, but also um, might not be as effective in some cases. And there's, a, there's also something really exciting here. There's this connection between in the collective action literature, um, folks talk a lot about production functions and trying to model how a collective uh, effort is kind of more successful as more people join. And in the machine learning literature, people really like to kind of plot machine learning performance versus data set size. And we have this really nice uh, connection where, where folks in the collective action literature will talk a lot about accelerating versus decelerating, decelerating production functions. So does your thing get even easier? Does your, uh, your good, your utility, um, kind of grow in an accelerating fashion as more people join? Um, and these curves are basically, they look just like, it's the same kind of shape as these machine learning curves. So we can kind of pick a given technology, look at the relationship between its performance and the data set size, and use that as an indicator of how successful, you know, if 30% if of the user base uh, joins our data strike or a data poisoning effort, this is roughly how much uh, damage we'd expect to cause to a recommender system. And therefore, this is how much damage we're going to cause to the profit. And um, no one has done this yet, but we think this provides a really nice way of actually helping organizers get a quantitative assessment of how effective a particular, a particular campaign will be. So this is all I should really preface. This is all really highly theoretical. I get a ton of questions when I talk about this, like, oh, so like, are you organizing data strikes? Like, how many data strikes have you done? I um, mean, that's not really, that's not where I am yet. Yeah, I'm a, just a PhD student. I, I really should uh, emphasize that. But um, we're quite excited about the possibility and think that this is a really, this could be a really useful framework for shifting balances of power a little bit, or a lot, hopefully. <laughs> do you think, um, I'm curious, I got a couple questions. Um, do you think that, so just based on your work, do you think that um, if you can get, if you can peel off sort of a, a relatively small minority of the users of a certain service through like a data strike, um, do you think that that will have a meaningful impact on the on the company? Like, what what how big would a data strike need to be before it would, um, you know, start to concern the, a company? Yeah. So, also just as a side meta note, if uh, if folks are not interested in this topic, I'm happy to like have a set up a smaller call sometime and talk. I don't want to dominate um, the the meeting time, but I'll also answer a question. <laughs> I just was feeling a little concerned about, you know, talking too much. Um, yeah, so we, we can answer that. The, the first thing I'd want to do is I'd want to know the, the particular learning curve for the technology that's being kind of um, leveraged against. And if we, if we have that, which in some cases we might, especially if it's a large um, open source and very well uh, documented machine learning technology, we can basically say, oh, when this technology loses, when this particular like model goes from 10,000 data points to 5,000 data points, it goes from 97% accuracy to 93% accuracy. And if we know something about how um, false positives and false negatives kind of correlate to, to profit or the revenue generation process, um, we could have a really kind of precise estimate of, of the damage and how likely that movement will be to succeed. But more generally, so most of the time we won't have that because a lot of mo the most uh, profitable technologies are the ones that are not you know, open on GitHub and with lots of really good clear papers describing them and showing their learning curves. Um, so instead, what I'd say is if it's a small minority group, you'd actually want to avoid data strikes and probably either focus on data poisoning for which a really small group can have a really large impact. I mean, it just requires a lot of technical expertise. You might have to go online and find the latest data poisoning paper and figure out this very clever creative technique where they are, are doing some sort of um, you know, using some assumptions about the model in order to, to mess up the, the weights, the model weights basically. Um, or you can engage in, in conscious data contribution because if there's a small minority who has some shared interests or has some shared affinities, probably their data, uh, their small data set that they band together could be really effective, um, could give that, that group a better machine learning technology than the large tech company already. And that's where kind of data co-ops would come in. And the idea there being, I guess, is that if you are, uh, if you mostly like, like to watch niche comedy videos on the internet, then YouTube's recommender system might not be as good for you. YouTube's general purpose recommender system, which of course does lots of personalization, might not be as good as a recommender system made by you and a thousand other people with the same niche comedy interests. Um, 
And that's where like this kind of conscious data contribution idea would come in. Um, one figure from our papers is that, for instance, if you look at some of the um, state of the art, just like a classic movie recommendation tasks, so like the Netflix prize, this is like you try to predict what someone will give a star rating to a movie. Um, using some of the, this is back in 2018, some of the popular models we found and popular data sets, we found that if you take away 30% of the users, if 30% of the users engage in a data strike, the, pers the, the added benefit of personalization over just recommending everyone the most popular movie um, goes down by half. So that was kind of a striking figure. That's like the number, I think we put that in the abstract and put that in the, in the intro because we, we found that to be kind of a, a very powerful idea. And also if you convert that into like years of computer scientists work, it's, it's like 12 years. It, you went back in performance to the performance 12 years ago. Um, so that's pretty striking. So 30% is a lot of people, of course, uh, in that particular data set, it's not because the, the data sets that folks do um, machine learning papers on are, are much smaller than what tech companies actually use to, uh, in some cases, not always. Uh, but we, we do think that like a 30% data strike could definitely be effective. If you're talking about just like less than 1% of the users though, I would say that data poisoning or conscious data contribution are the more exciting data levers for that particular type of group. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's super interesting and uh, super important to the future of, of activism around data. Um, you're, uh, so thanks for, thanks for your work. You're doing the hard thinking that the rest of us are gonna need, <laughs> so. Yeah, I'll just reply real quick. Um, I'm Allison, I'm in St. Pete, Florida. I'm um, just, hey, hi everyone. I joined a few calls, really, really cool stuff you all are doing. I'm happy to be part further. Um, Nick, are you at Northwestern? Cool, um, yeah, I'm starting my remote program for clinical mental health counseling uh, this week actually. So I'm hoping to get in contact and maybe start researching and collaborating with Dr. Professor Russell Fulmer. Um, he does ethical AI consulting for mental health um, work specifically. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'd like to speak with you more because um, I'm definitely interested in this topic too. So thanks. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Uh, floors open. Does anybody have anything, uh, anything going on that they'd like to let the group know about? Any questions? Um, any thoughts? Actually, <clears throat> going back to, to to Nick, what you were talking about, I don't think, I don't know if Joe's available to join this, but we've been working on um, a fictional story together and talking about, Joe, are you there? No, okay. And we were thinking about how to incorporate some more drastic, um, dramatic points. And we were thinking about data something like a data strike might be a good idea to add into it. What do you think, Joe? We can maybe sure, add, we talk can. to Nick on the side. I, I've already downloaded the paper, Nick. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so if we could try and think about it, like what would be, you know, imagine if the things that you're trying to figure out were figured out and what would be, what would that look like from, um, you know, one group standpoint, we could talk about it later. That would be great. Look forward to it. I would love to. Yeah. Okay. Nick, I also really like the the example of um, conscious data contribution by people who, let's say, have refined taste in comedy or something like that. I think that <laughs> that's a very interesting idea. Um, and you know, you you framed it in terms of sort of like. Um, support for companies that you want to support on ethical basis. Have you also thought about it in terms of 
um, you know, people banding together uh, to try to you know negotiate equity in a in a in a startup that they um, support or that sort of a thing. Yeah, that's definitely one. I mean, originally one of the big uh, the type. So we in in our work we've we've kind of alluded very generally to what sort of demands might be made. Like we haven't tried to um, fix on one. I guess a an original originally this was that this work started. I guess three years ago, we were definitely went right when the data dividends uh, conversation was picking up, and that's something that we were thinking about: is that people might engage in large scale uh, data leverage campaigns around trying to to get companies to to pay them in some way or fund public goods that the uh, the group of of data leverage wielders are interested in. Um, yeah, get like bargaining around equity would be a really interesting way of doing that as well, or something like the the data dividends. Um, work from from this group or from the related group i guess not this group uh yeah so i guess that's definitely that's not one i haven't specifically thought about that one but i think that's a that's a promising direction um and and more generally i'm, I'm hopeful that if people if if groups are successful if once there's a successful data leverage campaign this could be this could kind of have a snowballing effect in terms of making it um much more realistic and and kind of creating some some momentum where where the public would feel more excited about collective action. I think in general, there's just kind of a, like collective action has been really, you know, subject to a smear campaign, at least in the United States, um, in a way that is really disincentivizing. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, I guess, fingers crossed that this could be a, uh, this could start something of a critical mass noble effect. How much are you thinking about intersectional social data um, or identity in the whole scheme of it? Because say if somebody had, you know, if you're starting from the individual perspective and you, it's a bit overwhelming to find the groups, but if you had some kind of interface before that you could kind of plug in all the different groups or communities that you're part of and see branch out from there. Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't, uh built anything around there yet. I think that's a really promising uh, di direction for solving the, especially the like overwhelmingness problem that right now, if I sit down on my computer and I think I wanna do some data, I wanna do some data leverage today. I'm gonna, you know, exert some power against large organizations and firms. Um, I, I'm coming at it as an individual and there's not a place where I can go to, um, you know, find find communities or kind of place myself within a community. And that that's a big barrier to like an individual actually sitting down and and downloading these browser extensions or clicking delete on their um, records or, or something like that. Um, so I, 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 I'm really hopeful that some kind of online community or tool or uh, kind of yeah place finding a system could solve that problem. And I think we we have to solve that problem for uh, for these yeah. to, campaigns to be successful. Even that, I wonder whether like you couldn't actually like leverage existing social networks that people are on to try to identify the groups, you know what I mean, somehow. Like, I don't know what tools can be used to sort of navigate those from a decentralized community's perspective, but. Um... Yeah, I, de I definitely think that that could be a, a promising way. There's a really there's a really fun uh, computational challenge here where uh, if you're trying to to model the, the spread of these things, that the, the data, it's some of the most valuable data itself is the social graph data that people would want to delete to uh, harm the, the tech companies' technologies. Um, but that social graph data is also what you'd want to use to help people uh, find their connections and figure out which communities to join. Um, so you could run into these interesting like uh, loops where you you have this graph, and um, halfway through, folks are getting are really being successful and starting to join these data strikes, and they're kind of deleting their edges and they're uh, you know tactically. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly like what I kind of imagine is actually you construct and reconstruct simultaneously. It's kind of like imagine. I don't know if you've ever seen. It's like weird cyborg things where they imagine like you know you take out cells of the human body replace them like something that fall and like gradually the human the machine well this is like that in reverse almost it's like you take the machine and you gradually put in these decentralized elements sort of maintain topology transform the control over it i think that's almost like what jen was alluding at maybe you know what i mean Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm writing that down right now. So.
Um, well, Matt, if, if no, no one else is going, maybe I'll just talk for a couple minutes about some of the things I, I'm thinking about doing, just so people are aware. So one, one project that we're working on is a joint book um, that uh, I'm going to work on with Danielle Allen, Michelle Rempel. Uh, those two, I think, are familiar to this community. Um, but also a guy named Johnny Moore, who's an a, a evangelical Christian leader. Um, and um, uh, someone named uh, Mark Steers, who was one of the advisors to um, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, the last leader before Corbyn, uh, uh, Miliband, Ed Miliband. Um, and uh, it's going to be an attempt, you know, I, I don't know if you saw well, I'm not a market radical, you know, I, I, I've been rethinking a lot of the ideas. It's going to be an attempt to sort of bring together with them and lay out um, both the near term and longer term agenda in a less sort of econ geeky way than market radical, you know, uh, radical markets did. Um, so we'll, we'll see exactly where that goes, but it, it should be an interesting effort. Danielle, as some of you may know, is running for a governor of Massachusetts. So it will also sort of interact with her political campaign in various ways. So um, that's one project. The second project is um, I'm, I'm more and more focused on AI and the problems with the AI discourse. Uh, some of you might have seen what I wrote um, for Wired about that. Um, Divya Siddharth, who's not on the call, unfortunately, but uh, is a very active member of the community, and I are working on a longer piece sort of written in a sort of rationalistic tone, but that is really like a pretty systematic deconstruction of AI and why it's not a productive direction for technology. Um, so that's another thing that should be coming out pretty soon. And we're gonna be giving talks at like a lot of the leading AI shops like DeepMind and so forth about that. So we're kind of on a push to change the discourse around AI. Um, and a third, uh, uh, thing is that we have a piece that looks like it's going to come out pretty soon in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung or another top German newspaper about the Data Governance Act. And Matt could speak to some of the issues there if he wants to, but uh, it's sort of making the case uh, for making sure that this Euro particular piece of European legislation, which whose leaked draft was very promising and whose final version is not as promising, sort of back in the, in the right direction. So, um, those are some of the things that that I'm I'm focusing. Oh, and and finally, like there, you, you, I mentioned some previous calls, but there's these sort of more cultural things, games and movies and so forth that I'm also very much thinking about. So, yeah. So, I one word on the Data Governance Act stuff is that w we're really. Um, uh, I, I'm involved in a in a big push right now to to try to get um, public comments out there and generate some public conversation on a on a particular point of data policy, which is basically uh, pe people's ability to um, to exercise their rights to data collectively uh, as opposed to individually. So, in other words, there's a um, uh, and and this is this is kind of a this is sort of a um, an ideological push pull that's quite hard to track unless you're paying extremely close attention. But basically, um, you know, some some people are arguing that data, you know, a lot, including many people who I consider to be extraordinarily well intentioned, I would add, are are arguing for um, data rights to be sort of inalienable from the individual, which would mean that they can't be assigned to uh, to intermediaries that can help us uh, exercise them collectively. And by making rights uh, inalienable to the individual in that way, we, act, we, we prevent collective action uh, in, in exactly the same way that like a uh, right to work laws by making your right to contract with an employer inalienable, make collective bargaining in the labor market impossible. So there's this, interesting thing um, going on and uh, uh, I'm trying to help, uh, I'm trying to encourage um, all kinds of folks in different fields to, uh, to pay attention to that and start 
uh, start bringing out that distinction uh, to, to and, and that is what those piece in the FAZ will speak to. So. Right. Yeah. Um, one, so one other thing I wanted to, it, Joe, is it all right if I share the uh, MPLEX video? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. sure. Uh, so this is a, uh, this is a short video um, uh, that Joe and I did uh, talking about the, uh, the license, the sort of the salsa slash cost uh, licensing system that is going to be used in a uh, in a in a real life real world real estate project um, uh, later this year. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about it. it it's going to be a completely like unprecedented project um, in that it will allow the you know in in a mixed use real estate development it will allow people who are using the different spaces within the real estate development to hold their space according to a salsa license um and um uh it's super experimental but i think it's going to work great and if it does work great uh it could conceivably inspire uh uh all kinds of different um real estate developers or or others who who control physical spaces in in various ways to sort of have the courage to to um, allow their space to be used in this more open textured ways Salt, Kalia says salsa license. So let me let me define that. Uh, so what, what I mean when I say salsa license, what I mean is is that you know the the occupant of of a particular space, instead of being a a, a renter or a traditional owner, um, has the right to occupy the space, like let's say like a retail storefront. They have the the right to occupy that space pursuant to a license, which they. Uh, self-declare the value of so you self-declare the value of of uh, of your of your license and then you pay a tax um, or a fee a license fee calculated against that um, set self-declared value the self-declared value is also a sell offer so anyone who values it more highly than you will um, have the ability to buy it from you at specific intervals um, not 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 literally at any time. So you've got you know sufficient sort of, um, uh, um, you know, re reasonable certainty you'll be able to occupy it for a particular period of time. But at regular intervals, comes back up for auction, um, and um, uh, there's obviously a lot more to say about this. We've written a, written a lot about it, but it's it's a way of um, um, of evening out monopoly rights in land more or less um and uh really exciting All right. Anything else to uh, anybody else got something on their mind that they're being a little shy about sharing? Another thing to keep uh, uh, to keep track of is that uh, in the uh, in the first half of, of this year, we're going to be uh, working hard on a collaboration with um, ITS Rio, which is a Brazilian civil society organization on uh, putting together quadratic voting pilots um, in Brazilian uh, state and regional legislative bodies. Um, so um, um, hopefully there's gonna be a lot of cool data that comes out of that and um, um, 
you know, sort of continuing the the momentum of of, of alerting policymakers and and citizens to to QV as a um, as a better way of of taking collective decisions. So I'll continue to kind of give updates about that. And anybody who has uh, anybody anybody with thoughts, or particularly anybody um, in in Brazil who wants to pay closer attention to that, um, uh, by all means, reach out. And that's all I've got, unless anybody else would like to take the floor. Hi, um, I'd like to share if folks are interested, I'm hosting a, a workshop conference the first week of February. Um, it's called the Thoughtful Biometrics Workshop and we are it's going to be an unconference, so it's really defined by the people who come, but we really are trying to create a space where folks who are biometric scientists, like that's their day job, identity management folks, and civil society folks, plus anyone else concerned about biometrics and, you know, biometrics and sort of reading people in different ways is a big part of where a machine learning and AI is applied. So anyways, if you guys, you're, you're welcome to come. It's thoughtfulbiometrics.org is the website. And it's um, basically three hours of sessions each on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of that week. So yeah, that's an invitation to the folks in the community who are interested. Thanks, Clea. All right, thanks. Let's, uh, if there's no other announcements, uh, let's jump off and uh, enjoy the rest of our days. Good to connect with you all and um, talk soon. Cheers. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.